Today's message completes our series, God is Good. It doesn't mean that God's not good after we finish. It just means that we're finished expressly talking about the goodness of God. I did want to, uh, to be sure that we, we touched today's topic before we left there because it is so um, important and is so valuable for us to remember that in the midst of trouble, God is still good. You have your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me to Job chapter 29. <clears throat> if you want to, uh, to read about somebody who had trouble, read the book of Job. <coughs> trouble came into his life. 29 is, is near the end of the story of Job, chapter 29, and it, it gives Job's response to everything. We haven't heard Job express himself very much throughout, and then he gives a, a long response to his friends who have come to him, to God, who he's wondering if all that he's done through all of his life has been in vain. Job 29, verses 2 through 6. Job says, How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me, when His lamp shone upon my head, and His light, and by His light I walked through darkness. Powerful, powerful vision there. He says, then He says, Oh, for the days when I was in my prime. How many of us long for the days when we were in our prime? When, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for me streams of olive oil. Wow! Job had it good. Have there been those times in your life when God seemed so far away? Maybe I should pose the question in another way. Do you remember the days when you could taste the goodness of God? Do you remember the days when His presence was palatable for you? Did you ever have those times when you walked hand in hand with the Lord down the road of life and everything just seemed to follow a nice, easy, gentle path? Job had been in that place. Can't you just feel the presence of the Lord in these verses as Job recounts where he has been? He and God have been doing fine. He and God were on a first name basis. It was almost as though God had given Job the Midas touch. Whatever he touched turned to gold. It was beautiful. Oh, how Midas wanted that touch until it went bad. You, you probably, this summer, you probably had those times when you walked out in the grass and and as you stepped down and pulled back, the water kind of filled in because it was so spongy and moist. Probably next week that'll happen again. That, that, that'll happen to you. But Job says, my path dripped with cream. When he stepped down on the ground, cream bubbled up. Almost like it was Jed Clampett. And there was, a, there was oil. Just bubbling crude came up. He says, Bubble and cream just came up from the path. I didn't have to milk a cow or a goat or a sheep or anything. The cream just flowed toward me. That's a picture worth a thousand words if you'll just examine it. Dorothy had the yellow brick road, but Job had the creamery. Moses and the children of Israel had water from the rock, but for Job, he says, oil flowed from the rock. Job knew the value and the blessings of God. And maybe you've known that in 
your life as well. Then the question comes, are you still on the gentle path? Or has the great way grown harder and more difficult? If the way is more difficult, have you ever questioned why it is so? Have you ever wondered why God seems to be more distant than He once was? Or perhaps you've even wondered, where has God gone? Job laments his present condition. It seems to him that God has abandoned him. The lamp of God's light that has always guided him down the path of life seems to have gone out, and he doesn't know where to go. He's not sure which way to turn. God seems to be missing in action, especially now when everything else seems to be falling apart. The whole world has crashed in on Job, and he feels alone. He feels abandoned. I cannot tell you how it happened for you or when it happened. I only know this one thing, that if you're walking down that path and the light goes out, if you feel like the world is crashing in on you, I want you to know that God is still good. God has not abandoned you or forsaken you. God has not given up on you or left you to your own devices. God is with you. And even when you don't feel Him close at hand, rest assured, He's still there. He's still watching out for you. He's still looking over you. He's still carrying you, if you will. The sentiments of the familiar poem, Footprints, comes to mind. Reminds us that Life is like a sandy beach and we can look back and we can see those times when God was walking with us because there were two sets of footprints in the sand. But then we notice that there were some times when there was only one set of footprints in the sand. And we wondered, we began to think about those times and we said, you know, those were some of the most difficult times of my life. And there's only one set of footprints. Where was God? And God gently reminds us, those are His footprints. We were too weak to walk through that place in life, and He carried us. We might be tempted to question God. <coughs> Job doesn't realize that God is still right there with him. God has not abandoned him. God is not missing in action. God is there. Yes, life is a little harder for him. A lot harder for him. But that doesn't mean God is gone. That doesn't mean God doesn't care. In the next chapters in the book of Job, God expounds on the greatness of his knowledge and wisdom. He's not bragging. He's just telling the truth. There's a difference between that he recounts the many grand and wondrous things that God... God recounts His own works and His wonders on a daily basis, the things that He does. He sees things. He knows things. He understands things that we're barely able to understand in our modern scientific age. God says, I tell them what to do, and I've trained them how to do it. I've given them the rules and the laws that govern all of nature. For me, the implication is that if God feeds the lions when she is hungry, He certainly cares for Job. Jesus said it a little differently. He said, he said, if God feeds the sparrows and cares about those littlest things, don't you think He cares for you as well? Job chapter 40, verse 2, God says, Will the one who contends with the Almighty Correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Have you ever pointed a finger at God and accused him? Who are we that we should think ourselves so wise that we can tell God what to do? 
Who are we that God should listen to our counsel? And yet he always does. Eventually, Job apologizes to God. Maybe you need to do that too. And Job says, I spoke of things I did not know. And then he says, I have heard of you, but now I have seen you. Wow, was I ever wrong. That's the Dwayne Parker translation. You see, we cannot know all of the counsel of God. We don't understand His ways. And until we go and live with Him forever, we will not know. We will not understand everything. And even then, I'm not sure we'll ever fully comprehend God. But we still have this assurance. God is good. I've just finished listening to the autobiography of Stephen Curtis Chapman, one of Christian artists, uh, Christian music's greatest artist. One of God's greatest vessels for good. In his book, he tells of his early life growing up, his dad starting a music store, and that's where he learned to play guitar, and where he realized that he had a talent. And he, he speaks of going to college and meeting his wife, Mary Beth, at a place called Anderson College. Amazing. He retells the stories of writing the songs and the inspirations that led to them, everything that he wrote seemed like it was coming out of his life. <clears throat> Much of the last part of the book, if you're interested in a tearjerker, the last ten chapters or so deals specifically with the death of their five-year-old daughter, Maria. They had adopted Maria from China, the third of their children that they adopted from China. Maria had lived with them for four years, and she was a scoundrel. She was the life of every party that they had. She was the loudest of the children. She was the, she was the one who had the biggest personality. And one day, as their youngest son was driving home from school, Maria ran out to meet him in the driveway. And he didn't see her, and she didn't stop and she died right there. Stephen Curtis Chapman tells him years of agony trying to understand why. Where he died. Why did God permit this? Why didn't God raise her from the dead? Through all of this, Stephen and Mary Beth struggled with grief and loss, but they never lost their faith. They questioned God, and they may have, still have many unanswered questions about all of that. But in the midst of their pain, they never doubted that God was good, or that God was. In fact, it was a song based on Job's story that led them through most of it. We sing it here sometimes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You give and take away. Job said at the beginning of his ordeal, when his homes were gone, when his livestock were gone, when his children were killed, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So why is there sickness in the world? Why do bad things I want to tell you there are a number of reasons why sickness comes to us. The first of which is the inevitable universal answer. It's the same one that I gave several weeks ago. It's because the world's broken. In God's perfect world, there would be no sickness. In God's perfect world, there will be no sickness. No pain, no death. In a perfect world that we don't know about, but we believe.
believe is coming, there will be no sickness at all. Perhaps a better question for, for us to ask is, is why do some people are, have health at all? Why are any of us born healthy if this world is so bad? And I tell you, the only reason that any of us <coughs> recover, any of us have health of any kind, is because God is good. The second reason why sickness comes is because of our, not because of the universal aspect of sin, but because of a personal aspect of sin. Sometimes we engage in activities which are risky, which put us at greater risk for disease or sickness, and so when it comes, we should, well, I did it to myself. I caused this. I brought this on myself. And again, there are those people who engage in risky activity and never get sick. And we should ask maybe the question, why didn't they? Instead of why do we? Neither of these is the reason for Job's problems. Neither of these is the reason for people like Stephen Curtis Chapman and his wife Mary Beth and their family. So why do bad things happen to good people? A third reason, one that we're not often willing to think of or understand, trials and tests come to us might have something to do more with God than with us. So you already told us, Brother Park, you already told us God doesn't bring us Temptation. God can't be tempted by evil, and there's no, and, he's, and He doesn't tempt us with evil either. I said, Yeah, that's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. If we look at Job's situation, in the beginning of Job's story, God has placed a hedge of protection around Job and his family, and the devil, the accuser, goes into heaven and says to God, You know, if you'd remove that, God would curse you. But God, you see, has more confidence in Job than Job has in God. God, God says, oh no, not Job. He said, I'm going to remove the heads of protection I've placed around him. And you'll see, Job is better than you think he is. God permitted Job to endure great suffering and grief because God believed in the character of Job. God had confidence in Job. God says to the accuser, Have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like Job in all the world. Perhaps God allows his servants to go through some stuff because he trusts that they will come through with their faith intact. Scripture affirms that God promises to us that he will not give us too much. And you say, well, maybe you got this formula wrong. It feels like too much. <coughs> Scripture says with the temptation, with the trial, God will provide a way of escape so that it will not crush us. We sing that song today. I'm pressed, but not crushed. I'm persecuted, but not abandoned. I'm pressed down, but not destroyed. When I was younger, and my dad, who was raised without a father, didn't have a good example of a father figure, and so... The way that he demonstrated his love to his children was uh, he picked on us. He, he, uh, we didn't have tickle fights because he wasn't ticklish, but we got tickled. And he would, he would, would do stuff just to aggravate us. We said, Dad, quit. He said, well, if I didn't pick on you, you wouldn't know I loved you. And I always wanted to say to my dad, I never did. I always wanted to say to my dad, Dad, I just wish you didn't love me so much. Sometimes it was hard to get through. And some of us might be saying to God right now, Father, thanks for the confidence in me, but you know, you don't have to have that. If you just had a little less confidence in me, maybe trouble would go away. I could 
can sure use a larger hedge of protection if you don't want it. God has confidence in you. When He gives, He doesn't give. When He allows and permits the trials and the sickness and the problems to come, He knows you. He trusts you. He believes in you. You can't handle it on your own, but with Him, A fourth possibility which occurs to me is, again, more about God than about us, but it's about God trusting us with circumstances, with difficulties. It's almost like in, in case three where God has confidence in us, but this one is, is much weightier. In that case, God brings trials and circumstances to test us, but in this one, God trusts us with a sacred opportunity. A story lead which came out in the news last week was about uh, a, one of the European nations and their scientists have discovered with 98% accuracy they can predict the presence of Down syndrome in a fetus that's just weeks old. Now they were celebrating that they could predict it so that parents could make wise decisions about their family's future and they could abort this child with Down syndrome with 98% confidence that they'd done the right thing. But what many parents with children who are, have special needs find learning disability and developmental disability is that though the task is difficult, it is also a sacred trust. <coughs> God has given them their little bundles. They're still gifts from God. And many parents find the treasure wrapped up in those bundles of joy <coughs> and sorrow and hope and sadness. Why me? Why you? Perhaps God has blessed you with the struggle. Perhaps God has given you such a big challenge precisely because God wants to trust you with His special people. God has come.
in this world you will, not might, have trouble. You will have trouble. But then he says this. Take heart. I have overcome the world. From this one passage of scripture, I believe Jesus is telling all of us, each of us, you will have problems. Christians are not exempt from difficulties. Paul writes something similar to us in the familiar passage in Romans chapter 8. We like to quote Romans 8, 8 because it speaks of our overcoming the troubles of this life. But sometimes we miss the more important precursor to the overcoming, the trouble. See, if you're going to overcome trouble, then you have to experience trouble. If you're going to overcome hardship, you have to experience hardship. If you're going to have persecution, you can conquer that. Paul says there's famine, there's nakedness, there's danger, there's the sword, and yet the encouragement is still true. None of these things will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I could give you one encouragement today. I would tell you trouble's coming if it's not already here. Trouble is coming, but we're more than conquerors. Yeah. Problems may surround us on every side, but God is still good. Finally, we have the testimony of the Apostle Paul. His personal testimony 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He was struggling with some physical ailment. He called it the thorn in the flesh. Three times he prayed that God would release him from the pain, from the torment, from the difficulty. God's answer was short and to the point. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, when I am weak, he is strong. And so maybe trouble comes to Christians <coughs> so that God's strength can increase in our lives. That doesn't mean God's not good. Because he always is. And he always will. And if you haven't come to know that strength that comes in weakness, I'm not sure how you've survived this long. But I want to let you know there is strength for the weaknesses of life. There is a hope beyond all hope for those who trust in the Lord. And though we may have trouble in this life, Jesus, so okay.